Hello, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Night Sky, our edition for October the 6th, 2021. Can you believe it's already October? Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the solstice or the, uh, I'm sorry, the equinox, the beginning of fall. And uh, at least in my neighborhood, things have cooled off a lot. So we're not having 100 degree temperatures anymore. We are having really nice, beautiful um, morning cool. Um, so the time to get out now, of course, is first thing in the morning. You get out, do your walking and running then. Um, we have a great show for you tonight. We're actually kind of talking a lot about Jupiter and especially Jupiter's moons. And our special guest tonight, who I'll introduce in a moment, is going to tell us about a mission to one of those moons called Europa. Uh, before we go there, um, I just wanted to introduce the team and, um, and tell you who's on board here and a little bit more about what we're doing tonight. Um, we have... Um, uh, if you sort of notice, you might have the uh, closed captioning transcript across your screen or on your screen. You're in control of that. We do that. We launch that because we know some people use it. And we also makes it easier for us to record to uh, post these recordings. But if you don't want it, you can turn it off and you can do uh, do do with it what you like. We recommend that you just sort of like do a little side view uh, where either the name or the picture of the presenter is on one part of your screen and open up the main part of your screen for PowerPoint presentation. Um, you're in control of all that. So uh, we uh, do not allow chat in this webinar format, but we do have question and answer button available to you. And we want to hear from you. So I'll say it maybe a couple of times during the hour, but uh, we'd like you to engage. So if uh, something you hear tonight sort of strikes your fancy, if you want us to dig a little deeper, if you want to know a little bit more about one of the subjects we're going to touch on tonight, then please get it into those questions. Uh, you'll have um, ready answers from some people working in the background, and we'll bring some of them forward during breaks, and we'll do a live answer of some of the, the audience questions. But please avail yourself of that. That would be really cool. It helps kind of make these things, this, this particular program, uh, uh, interactive, as you might say. Um, we've got a lot of guests tonight, and we want to welcome everybody that uh, has been uh, long-term uh, visitors of our virtual night sky and the new ones as well. Let me introduce the team. So my colleague is Meg Hufford, and she's been joining us for all of these. She uh, does a lot of that work in the organization and coordination in the background. Meg and I are actually preparing facilities on campus to start having live visits from the public. Uh, we think after the first of the year, uh, we will be able to have you guys come visit us rather than and us getting into your living rooms and onto your computer screens. I think we're going to keep both formats going uh, as long as we can, but we're looking forward to having people on campus. That would be great. Uh, uh, Kim Baptista is your webmaster. She's the one that's uh, kind of managing the program. She's the one that communicates with you and gets this thing all set up and uh, and uh, kind of rallies the group here to uh, to do our rehearsals and our overviews to make sure we get it right. Uh, so thank you, Kim, for that. I have a special announcement tonight about Alicia. Hyatt. She has been with us ever since we started, almost every single program. And uh, I can say that Alicia is a former student worker. But the congratulation is, is that uh, Alicia is our most recent staff member. We basically converted her from a student to a staff. She's going to be with us, and she'll be, uh, be joining us for these virtual nights, guys. And congratulations to Alicia. That's really hard work to get out of school and into this, uh, the role that you're in. So uh, she's an education research specialist for us. And that means that she can uh, help us with content and help us get organized to do school shows and all of those kinds of things that we think we find very valuable. Uh, Alex Blanche is a student who's been with us for some time and he's on board too. Alex and Alicia will be answering your questions in the background. I also have, uh, there's a team of students on campus tonight and I'm broadcasting from campus and they're actually sort of outdoors doing a program with some other students and they're looking through telescopes. We are trying to arrange a telescope view of Jupiter. And I can't, no promises, but I think they might be able to kind of get this thing organized. And when they do, and if they do some kind of program, I think we're going to try to show you what Jupiter looks like live right now. And we can see what those moons are doing uh, on Jupiter. And so that would be, uh, or going around Jupiter, that would be really cool. All right, so uh, we have a guest speaker. He's going to be talking about a, an important mission, and then we'll have a, a program. I'm going to tell a little bit about the history of Jupiter's moons and how we discovered them and some interesting things along the way and how you can see them, most importantly. And then we'll wrap up with some resources and some current events that are going on. Um, and then I'm going to invite everybody to another program tomorrow night. You'll hear about that later. 
So without any further ado, the main uh, attraction tonight is Dr. Everett Schock. Uh, I've known uh, Dr. Schock for many, many years now, and uh, I know him as a, uh, as a man that works in Yellowstone National Park and studies uh, um, hot pools and hot springs and sulfur springs and those kinds of environments. And so uh, he also happens to be uh, on the science team for a mission that is going to explore Europa. And so I'm going to let him tell us all about that. Uh, Dr. Schock, welcome to the screen. And uh, I will back out, turn the program over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. I hope you folks can hear me. Um, hey, great. Good to see you. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Um, uh, yes, as Rick just mentioned, my name is Everett Schock. I'm a professor here at ASU in the School of Earth and Space Exploration, as well as the School of Molecular Sciences, where a lot of chemistry is done. And what I, what I do is I, I study how planets support life. Um, I do that with, uh, in a field called geochemistry, which is, you know, as the name suggests, applying chemistry to geology or trying to understand how the earth works through chemistry, uh, through the composition of rocks and water and organic matter and, 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 and the microbes, the tiny life forms uh, that are all, almost everywhere in the outer part of our planet. Um, so what do I mean when I say, how does the earth support life or how do planets support life? And from geochemistry, this means um, how do processes in a planet produce conditions where there are sources of energy that various life forms can tap into? How does the earth set the table for these microbes, for these uh, various very small organisms which are in incredibly numerous on our planet? Um, so why? Well, you might wonder why are we so obsessed with uh, microorganisms? Well, they're the most abundant type of uh, life on our planet, and they're uh, likely, um, they're, they're probably the most likely thing to type of life that might be present on another world in our solar system. And so when we are exploring the solar system for signs of life, typically we're looking for signs of microbial life. Uh, evidence that there may be uh, something living there. Now this focus on microorganisms is especially true when we think about what are called ocean worlds. Uh, we have several ocean worlds in our solar system. They're typically the large ice covered moons of Jupiter and Saturn for, for instance. And the amazing thing is there can be water underneath the ice on these planets, liquid water. So this is quite a surprising um, discovery over the last few decades. So um, back in 2015, NASA approved a mission to an ocean world in our solar system, uh, Europa, the, one of the moons of Jupiter, which we'll be hearing more about. And this, uh, the mission is called Europa Clipper. And the goal of the Europa Clipper mission is to determine, it, the, to the extent we can, if Europa can support life, is Europa habitable? Um, and not, so the point is not to find life, that would be a pretty high bar, but to just study and try to understand whether this uh, ocean world in our solar system is capable of supporting life. And then maybe if we, as we know more about it, we'd say, what kinds of life do you mean? Well, conditions on Europa are very different than conditions on the earth. Uh, we all walk around on the earth and we think about life on the earth. Um, and so here, I'm gonna start with uh, an image of what we see as we walk around uh, in Arizona. There you go. I hope that's uh, visible. It looks really good, thank you. All right. So on the left is a view from the Mount Baldy Wilderness way over on the east side, high, uh, high country on the east side of the state. And of course, the Saguaro Forest uh, uh, at Saguaro National Park in Tucson. So when we're thinking about life on our own planet, we walk around, this is the world in which we live at the surface. Um, we're surrounded by plants. We're surrounded by things doing photosynthesis. Um, well, that's going to be problematic as we start thinking about these other worlds. So let me just, um, if 
find the right button to push. Here we go. So from our, you know, living where we do on the earth and at the surface of the earth where the sun is shining on everything, you know, photosynthesis is really profound. It's really productive. We see all those plants and all the things that are living uh, uh, because those plants are there. But Earth's surface where we live is only one of Earth's habitable zones. There are many other, and we're going to many others, and we're going to see some some of those today. Um, you know, and that's a good thing because it turns out that the surfaces of most planets are really nasty places. They're inhospitable. Uh, they and um, Europa is a really good example of this uh, for reasons I hope I remember to get to later. Uh, but it's a it, it, living at the surface of Europa would be rough. Um, so if we're thinking about life beyond Earth in our solar system, we're not only talking about microorganisms and not things like plants and whales and people, um, but it's going to be life in the dark, not doing photosynthesis, but living on sources of chemical energy. All right. Here we go. There's a nice Hubble image of Jupiter. And that little white speck off to the side is the moon Europa. So that's what we're, that's where we're sending the Europa Clipper mission. Here's a close up view of Europa from the Galileo mission of the, of the 1990s. And you can see some remarkable things about the surface of this world. There are really very few craters. We're, we're very familiar looking at the moon or Mars or even some of the other icy satellites in our solar system. Um, they're often covered with craters. There's sort of one maybe out here in the middle. I don't know if my cursor is working, um, but um, there are very few craters. And that when we see a, a surface with lots of craters, of course, we say, well, that's because it's so old. It's been bombarded by stuff over a long period of time. So the converse of that is, if there aren't very many craters, then it's probably pretty young. Well, young in a geologic sense means, that, you know, for the surface to be young means the planet has to be active and th that the surface gets somehow uh, paved over through various processes at various times. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that Europe is particularly attractive because it seems to be a very active world. Well, here are some artists' renditions of what that's all about. Um, on the left, this is actually drawn to scale, and it's based on the evidence we have right now. We have this icy crust, liquid water underneath, and we're pretty confident about that liquid water. And then the seafloor, which might have some volcanic activity uh, from the heat coming out of the interior of Europa. And this is, there's a, on the right side of the screen is a close-up view of what that ice and ocean might look like. Remember, this is an artist rendition of a place we haven't yet been and this sort of detail. But nevertheless, um, the important thing I want to draw your attention to is that they've included a hydrothermal system at the bottom of this uh, ocean. So there's some kind of heat source down below in the rocky parts of the planet, and water is circulating through that and coming back out into the ocean uh, heated. Uh, well, this is, of course, something we're familiar with from our own planet. So what we're going to do um, right now is here we are in a view of the uh, Google Earth view of the western part of the U.S. And so we're in Arizona, many of us right now, certainly I am down here in Phoenix, and we're going to take a couple of quick field trips. One to the Gorda Ridge here off the coast of just, just about where California meets Oregon and off on the coast. That's a that's a, mid -ocean, a piece of the mid-ocean ridge system that has hydrothermal systems on it that we explored a couple of years ago. And then we will go to Yellowstone National Park where I've had the great pleasure of being able to work uh, now for the last 20 years of uh, field work in the summer. Well, here's a, some images from, what the, uh, from the subsea mission as it was called uh, back in May and June of 2019. Uh, here's what a lot of the ocean floor looks like. Um, those lumps are um, basalt, the igneous rock, uh, the lava that's lava that has erupted at the bottom of the ocean in this mid-ocean ridge. It's all bulbous like this because as the hot lava pour, punches out onto the seafloor, the outer part of it 
chills very quickly. And you get these, these are cleverly called pillow basalts by geologists, because they kind of look like pillows. But the point I want to make is it's kind of hard to see a lot of signs of life here. Uh, there's some, yeah, there's some interesting looking rocks and there's a lot of dirt lying around, but you know, that doesn't look like a place where life is thriving. This, on the other hand, uh, does look like it's got some life. There's all these wormy looking things and there's a, something that we might recognize as a crab. And there's all these funny spires. This is, this is a cooled down uh, hydrothermal system on the Gorda Ridge that we, uh, we encountered. Um, the active things, uh, let me give you a sense of scale here. These, these little, these spires here are only a few feet tall. So, uh, but nevertheless, it's um, a very active, hydrothermal system on the seafloor at the Gorda Ridge. And that, um, that water is coming out of this system at 290 degrees centigrade, which is 554 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's pretty much higher than you wanna set your oven uh, unless you wanna you know, burn the bread you're baking. So this is really pretty seriously hot water. Probably nothing living right there in that hot water, but the fact that this that this water starts out as seawater, it reacts with the rocks, it comes, it changes its composition because of reacting with the rocks. When it reappears at the bottom of the ocean, then there's all kinds of sources of chemical energy as that hot water mixes back into seawater. So if we back up a little bit, um, you see scenes like this. Now, what you see in the middle of this are some strange orange cones, which are an experiment, which I'll get to in a moment. But off to the uh, upper left, you might see this kind of shimmery zone of diffuse warm water coming up. And the whole thing is, in, this whole area is encrusted with all kinds of, of large enough, you know, organisms large enough to see. So some colleagues uh, involved in this project, colleagues of mine, had, did these experiments where they put these cones in this area of diffuse warm water flow to study the uh, microorganisms that might grow on various surfaces they'd put on inside those cones. So those cones are weighted so that they stay there at the bottom of the ocean. And when they went back to pick them up six days later, here's the mechanical arm on the remotely operated vehicle picking up one of those cones. So you might say it was a successful experiment. Not only uh, were things living on microorganisms living on the inside, but the outside of these cones have been colonized by all kinds of wonderful things that found this great new surface to live on. So this is literally six days. And so you really get the sense that life can be thriving around these hydrothermal systems on the seafloor. There's no light, there's no photosynthesis, just chemical energy, and yet life is thriving. So what do we got here? We got water reacting with rock, and when it does, it harvests supplies of chemical energy. Those chemical energy supplies support life, and it's thriving. We've seen that there. It's kind of spectacular. Um, that happens on hydrothermal systems on the seafloor, but it also happens at, on the um, continents, where it is easier, a lot easier, for us to visit and explore. And of course, the place we do that, and I mentioned earlier that I've been working now for about 20 years, is at Yellowstone National Park, where, uh, which is a big volcano uh, that uh, erupts roughly every, you know, once every million years or so. Its last eruption was 645,000 years ago. It's in the Rocky Mountains, lots of rain and snow, lots of water, and that water circulates deep, just like the water at the bottom of the ocean circulating into the hot new rocks, on the, the volcanic rocks on the seafloor. Same general idea is happening at Yellowstone, except you can walk around, um, you can you know, eat a sandwich and have a look. It's a lot easier than going to the bottom of the ocean. So let's have a look at some of these things. Here's the edge of a hot spring in Yellowstone. And I want, I want to draw your attention to the, the various bands of uh, colorful bands here. And I'm you know, asking here, what are we looking at? So the, you can tell maybe that the big hot spring is off to the upper right side of this picture. And the water is pouring out uh, up at the top and flowing around and pouring out towards us. Um, what you see in these, uh, these very bright kind of 
green colors and brown colors along the edge are the pigments of photosynthetic microorganisms. So these are the organisms that are, uh, you can see the evidence, you can see where they are, where they're using sunlight um, as their energy source. But there's a really sharp line. Photosynthesis has its limits. That's a whole topic on its own. We don't really understand completely what those limits are. But you can see a very sharp line and then a zone in here that's this kind of uh, not very colorful part of the system. Um, just because there's no bright pigments doesn't mean that there's nothing living there. That there are plenty of organisms living there. They're just nobody in that system, nobody in that community of life, that whole ecosystem there, nothing in there is using photosynthesis to make its living. Uh -huh. Well, let's go to another location. I wanna take you on a little bit of a very uh, uh, primitive kind of field trip here. We'll go to this hot spring uh, in Yellowstone. It's, uh, you can see the two parts to this pool. There's some of this mineral overgrowth called center over part of the pool. The pool is, act the water is actually pouring out over here to the right side through a channel that's completely overgrown by mineral deposits. And you can see a log here from a tree that's uh, died many, many, many years ago. So this pool is plenty hot. It says uh, in the slide here, 91.7 centigrade. Remember water's boiling boiling where we live at 100 degrees centigrade, but up at the elevation of Yellowstone, it boils at around 92 or 93 degrees. And this is definitely a boiling spring. And the water pours out of the spring and spreads off to our right. So I'm gonna pan with a few um, photographs here to pan over to the right. So give, give you a, a little bit of a, a scene of what's going on here. So the water is going down that little bit of a tube there to the right, and then it pours out and you can see it's splashing along and going out its outflow channel. Uh, no bright pigments yet. Um, and you can see these, the, looking further to the right, these channels split up and spread out, cover this huge area. We'll come back and visit this pink box in a moment, but you can begin to see here some of these pigments along the edge of the spring. So we can see where photosynthesis is beginning. And as we scan further to the right, and we can see that there's zones with all this pigmented stuff and all this wonderful photosynthetic organisms and completely <laughs> different topic because what we're interested in is what about these things that make their living without doing photosynthesis? So if we go back to that pink box and look straight down. So the field of view here is just uh, probably about three feet wide, uh, about two feet uh, high uh, from top to bottom. And this is that really high temperature outflow of the, of the spring. The temperature here is uh, around 85 degrees centigrade, 80 to 85 degrees centigrade. And I know it in centigrade, but I don't know it in Fahrenheit. I should have done the conversion for you, but there you have it. Um, you notice the, the additional pink boxes I've put on the image to highlight areas where there, you can maybe barely begin to see this kind of slimy looking horrible stuff in this hot spring. So let's, let's zoom in and have a look at those. Um, this, here, here's this goo living at this temperature close to boiling in this hot spring. Here's more of this goo. So this is a microbial community is made up of of microscopic organisms, but there's enough of them that you can see them just by looking in the hot spring, creating this, this, um, this material here. And here's another example. You can see which way the water's flowing from right to left and leaving these streamers of biological material streaming along. So here, this is you know, a pretty wonderful thing that you can just walk up, well, especially if you have a research permit, um, and study these kinds of systems where you know, there's an entire ecosystem right at Earth's surface where there's no photosynthesis involved. It's too hot for the photosynthetic organisms, but that doesn't mean there's not life there. There's plenty of life and it's really diverse and wild and wonderful. And we're just beginning to learn what, it, what it's all about. They're not doing photosynthesis, but some of the organisms in this microbial community are essentially using rocket fuel. They combine hydrogen and oxygen, and they make water from <laughs> hydrogen and oxygen. And that's the same energy we source, uh, energy source we use, excuse me, to launch rockets into space. So we know that's a pretty powerful energy source. 
I suppose we could have asked these microorganisms. They've probably known about it for a long time. Now, there's plenty of energy available in that sort of thing. So these are the kinds of things we study. We try to understand how it is that the water reacting with the rock and coming back to the surface uh, is able to um, support these kinds of systems, especially the ones without photosynthesis happening. So this is, once again, let's go back to Europa and think about this. The, uh, you know, one thing we can be sure if this really, th these drawings are, you know, this one's more to scale, this you know, one on the right is not really to scale, but you know, if there's like 10 kilometers, that's miles of ice, you know, it's gonna be dark in that ocean. <laughs> Light is not gonna penetrate. And then if there's another 50 or 70 kilometer deep ocean, the oceans on the earth on average are four kilometers deep. There's actually more water on Europa than there is on, in the Earth's oceans. This is a serious ocean world with tens of kilometers, tens of miles deep water. Um, it's dark at the bottom of the ocean. If anything's living down there, it's got to be living off of a chemical energy source. I just want to show you a couple of other images. Um, these are uh, really refined images from um, from that we have at present. And of course, we'll be getting many, many more fantastic views of Europa when Europa Clipper gets there. So these are the locations where these three images come from. Let me just zoom into them. This is, you know, this is fascinating stuff. This is the surface of this icy world. Look at all those fractures, you know, cutting across each other. You can see places where the fractures are offset by a more recent fracture. And then you've got this zone on the left where uh, it, you know, it's very chaotic. In fact, these are called chaos zones. You know, what in the world is going on over here? The whole surface looks really mashed up or is it you know, probably from underneath the, the way things are moving around? Here's a great picture of, uh, which is the same as the picture behind me tonight, of, of these cross-cutting bands of material on the surface of the planet. This really looks like an active place. Uh, really looks like stuff's going on here. The explanations involve the movement of the ice shale over the, um, the liquid water underneath and some really interesting uh, action that's going on there in that system, but you know, relatively few craters. And here's another really lovely image. We could spend a lot of time on these images where we see these bands uh, crossing through these sort of chaotic zones. So you can begin to figure out which came first, what, what, which sort of uh, things, and starting to get a, a, an idea of the, of the list of events, you know, the history of what this surface is trying to tell us. And of course, these are just hints of the kind of information we'll have uh, once Europa Clipper it gets to Europa. So here is an artist's rendition of what the Clipper spacecraft will look like flying over the surface of Europa. Notice the enormous solar panels. Um, most of the instruments on the, um, on the spacecraft are in the middle. Um, a couple of them are spread out. These might be able to see these long uh, antennas and other objects along the solar panel. That's a radar system. And there's this big tail sticking up here, which is the boom needed to uh, have the magnetometer running. That, uh, there's some images here of things actually being built. So this is really happening. <laughs> Stuff's being built. Um, the panel in the middle is that boom uh, thing that's going to run the, uh, host the magnetometer. The uh, the upper right is the um, antenna for communications, a very large antenna. You can see people here with pieces of the uh, spacecraft. So this is a large uh, spacecraft. The um, two images on the left, the, the upper left is the housing of the Ethemus instrument, which is, um, which is uh, being, uh, which is uh, Phil Christensen's instrument. And Phil Christensen is a, a member of the faculty of the School of Earth and Space Exploration as well. And he is in charge of this whole instrument. Uh, and down below that is the mass spectrometer, cleverly called MassSpecs. Uh, and I'm on the science team um, that will help uh, interpret the data and plan for what kinds of data we need to be gathering. They can see that all these pieces are being built. Here's a big hunk of the propulsion system being put together at the Advanced Physics Lab in 
um, at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And um, once again, there we are arriving in 2013. It's a long ways off where it doesn't launch for a few years. And then it's a long ways out there to Jupiter and Europa, but it's only 10 years away. Get ready now. We'll have all kinds of exciting information then. So thank you for your attention. Everett, thank you very, very much. This is absolutely amazing. So you said uh, 2013, you meant 2031. To, to oh, the, did I? I <laughs> no, I'm, which makes sense, but yeah, no, we're not going back in the past. This is not a time travel mission. No, these, uh, 31, like it says there. I'm sorry. Yeah, I these, lost my crib. These missions yeah. take just a long, long time to do. And so, uh, so, and then, so, and so, how long have you actually been working on this project? When did you get part of the science team? Is it, well, I was part of the, I, I, got attached to the science team for the mass spectrometer um, a few years before the, a couple of years before the mission was funded. Oh, okay. So I'm really, so I'm really a newcomer um, because they were putting together all the di diverse perspectives needed for the science team um, for, uh, for that particular instrument. Um, so that was probably around 2012 or maybe the mysterious 2013 or so when the final proposal was put together. Um, but people have been working on missions to Europa for decades and decades. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is really exciting. Can you tell me, I, I don't know if I heard it in, the, in your presentation or not, but are, are we actually going to be able to fly this machine through the plumes? Is that the idea? I mean, are we going to be able to get well, to... Really? Like, exhaust yeah. coming out of the moon and then we fly through does that actually is that real or does that happen yes that well okay. well we're very optimistic about these plumes um <laughs> the evidence for plumes from europa um is uh you know is all right it's it's not really terribly uh, robust evidence now it's pretty good um and, but we're thinking plumes because during the cassini mission to the saturn system um, Enceladus, the small, much smaller moon of Saturn called Enceladus, uh, had many, you know, a whole host of plumes of material spewing out. Those yeah, and that was a total surprise to, to people. So we're optimistic that there could be plumes coming out of this very active looking surface of Europa. It seems like a very likely thing. And as I said, there's some, you know, sort of uh, Hubble. Uh, imagery and so forth that is highly suggestive of plumes. So we're not dependent on there being plumes. We'll take advantage of plumes if they're there, but the whole mission is not designed, so, is designed around not being dependent on plumes, but being able to get all of its information from uh, whatever can be swept up from passing nearby. So the, the way the mission works is multiple flybys of Europa. It's not a lander, it's not an orbiter, uh, but it comes by many times over several years uh, at about uh, once a month for a few days of great you know, frenzy of activity um, as the uh, spacecraft gets very close to Europa. Because, because it's actually orbiting Jupiter, right? So it's Actually, gonna, yes, it's orbiting, it's orbiting it's Jupiter going. and then flying by the moon. Yeah, but, yeah, but not, in, not in a circular kind of orbit, but in a very big, broad, elliptical kind of orbit. And the, the main reason, uh, really the main reason for that is that the Jupiter has this enormous magnetic field. Um, there's all kinds of particles in the area. The radiation is intense. It's really, it's very, it's a dangerous place to have a spacecraft. That's one of the reasons why the surface of Europa is a lousy place to live. It's a radiation environment that is, you know, off scale from anything we know about. Um, so we really want the spacecraft to spend as little time as possible, but come in close, gather a whole bunch of data and then run away, uh, process the data, send, send stuff back to earth. Um, and then get ready for the next pass. So it, it has a limited amount of time that it can spend that close to Jupiter and Europa. Excellent. I'm going to like uh, um, get, kind of open up for some audience questions. So I'm going to invite Alex and Alicia to join the conversation here and tell us if we've got something going on. And I believe we have a, a live audience poll, a little another way that you can interact with us. We're going to kind of put a poll on your screen so you can you can answer questions on your own. Hi, Alicia. Hello, hi. We're gonna do this section a little different than normal. Alex and I are gonna popcorn it. So we're gonna do a poll question and then a Q&A and then a poll question and a Q&A and so on and so forth. 
Um, so my first poll question that I have, which I will launch right now, is which planet does the moon Europa belong to? So is it Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, or Pluto? Go ahead and cast your votes below. And Alex has a question for us. People better get this one right. Okay, so we have a question from Joe, and he asks, do we know how thick the icy crust is on Europa? What we have are models of what that the thickness of that icy crust could be. Um, there are there are models that indicate the crust might be relatively thin. I mean, imagine you've, you've got you know tens of kilometers of water and ice at the surface of Europa. So some of the models say that the that that ice could be you know maybe ten percent of that total amount, and other models say, well, it might be 30 or 40% of that total amount. And guess what? Those are called the thin ice models and the thick ice models. Very clever, don't you think? Um, but the, <laughs> um, so, so that's based on the observations from the Galileo mission, which explored the Jupiter system back in the, mostly in the 1990s, but a little bit into the 2000s. And um, the, the best evidence we, we have at present. And this is one of the things that will be resolved by the Europa Clipper mission and the multiple passes with the radar and the magnetometer and the various other instruments will really have a good, uh, mm -hmm. good handle on how thick the ice is and how deep the ocean is. Super. Thank you so much for answering that, Dr. Sharp. Uh, I'm gonna end our poll. Most Dr. of us got that right. 97% of us uh, said it was Jupiter. So that is correct, Ooh. Jupiter. Um, all right, <laughs> so oops, I will launch our second poll question now. And that question is, have you heard of the Europa Clipper mission before tonight? So go ahead and answer yes or no. And Alex, I think you might have another question for us. Look at this. So Stephen uh, wants to know Dr. Shock's opinion on planetary moon probes finding RNA or DNA based life. Could RNA life be more prevalent in our solar system than DNA? Uh, also greatly appreciate tonight's presentation. Well, this is, you know, this is a, this is a great question. Um, and it's really difficult to answer because what we don't know is pretty profound. <laughs> um, so you know, yeah, okay, professor, tell me about life on Europa. Well, okay, what am I going to say? I'll, what, I, what I know I can say is that life on Europa, if it's there, life on Europa fits Europa like life on the Earth fits the Earth. Now, if we actually really knew what we meant by saying life on the Earth fits the Earth, we'd have a better idea about thinking about life on Europa. Um, for, you know, Centuries ago, people started studying biology and geology separately, or maybe at least 150, 200 years ago. And biology and geology have grown up as separate fields, despite how they overlap in paleontology. Um, but you, you know, if you were to ask a biologist, you know, why, what is it about the composition of the interior of the earth that guarantees saguaro cactuses grow in Arizona? It's like not a question anybody can answer. And yet we're sort of asking those kinds of questions about Europa. What is it about the, how deep the ocean is or what the rocks are made of at the bottom of the ocean or how hot they get or blah, 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 that you know, defines what life is gonna be. Um, so it's uh, really quite hard to answer. So the, the, the details of DNA and RNA and the actual molecules involved in life on another world, I think we need to be careful to not necessarily assume that what we see around us is exactly the kind of same kind of things we're going to see elsewhere. And I think that actually perfectly ties into another question that we had from Jack, who asked what photosynthesis would look like on another planet. I think that basically answers it, that, you know, we can't always well, assume Earth will look the same. Yeah, um, you know, Photosynthesis, you need, you need to have a pleasant surface environment like we have on the Earth. Um, you look around the solar system, you look at the surfaces of planets, and I'm like, they're really hard to fig find some that you, where you want to live. Um, you know, if there was more obvious liquid water at the surface of Mars, yeah, we'd be talking a lot more about photosynthesis on Mars. 
Um, plenty of water on these icy moons out in the outer solar system, but they're way far away. The amount of solar uh, energy reaching them is a lot lower and their surface temperature is ridiculously cold. And they're like Europa's sitting in this horrible radiation environment. Ah, everything about the surface is just a disaster. It's not where you wanna live. The nice, comfortable interior with liquid water and all sorts of familiar things, ah, aha, that's a lot uh, more, that's a lot more, uh, you know, uh, it sounds like something where, uh, an environment where things could live, but no sunlight. So you have to give up on photosynthesis and go for these chemical energy systems. And luckily we have many systems like that on the earth that we can study and try to understand better how they work. So we can think more clearly by the time we get to Europa in another 10 years. I, I think that's actually sort of one of the keys to the school of earth and space exploration, if I might get, kind of like add that, right? I mean, we really have hundreds of years of geological knowledge that we've been building and building and building to sort of like, the, and the geochemistry and all that stuff. It, it gives us this opportunity to take the knowledge we have, how we explore here and, and advance it to other worlds and other planets. And, and yeah, yeah, definitely, the, the challenge with these ocean worlds is we, we're not quite sure we know what we're looking at. You know, when, when, we, when we look at Mars and we, we get the various spectral evidence of the surface and imagery and so forth, and we see something that we're pretty sure is like a basalt flow, and now we send a lander and they take a sample and they sniff around, they're like, ah, oh, this really looks like a lava flow. It's like, that's great as a geologist, right? We know what lava flows are. We, we've got them here in Arizona. We can immediately start talking about them. Uh, where are the rocks on Europa? Oh, they're just under a few tens of <laughs> miles of ice and water. water. So you're not going to get a rock anytime soon. And so for most geologists, this is like, oh, this is a little bit more trouble, right? Because that part of the planet is far from view and really far from sampling. So we have to figure out what it is with the evidence we can get by flying by. Excellent. Oh, good. Well, uh, thank you, Alicia and Alex. Uh, can we move on, or do we? Is there another? Uh, is there anything else you need? Uh, I can wrap up this poll super quickly. We'll end it here. Um, poll two: Have you heard of the Europa Clipper, Clipper mission before tonight? Forty-six of forty-six percent of us had, and fifty-four percent of us had not. So. Um, yeah, Dr. Sharp has been uh, teaching us many wonderful things tonight, especially, you know, that Europa is DOPA. So thank you for this <laughs> wonderful bout of knowledge. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Rick. So Lisa, I'm going to call you on something. We have this, we have a professor in our program called Dr. Sharp. And uh, yeah. and Alicia had taken classes from her, and this is Dr. Shark Shock, and I think you're going back. So anyway. Oh, did I? I'm sorry, Dr. Shock. <laughs> I, I should have well, right. Dr. I, Shock. and I are chucking. I'm chucking. You're talking me. about me. So, yeah. so anyway, uh, ever thank you so much for being a part and, and please really? hang out and, and just watch the rest of the program. And uh, so, do I understand correctly? And Meg, you might want to chime in. Is, does Justin have something for us to look at? Is that right? Did I see a little? Says note? he's ready to go, Rick. Let's call him up. See what happens, Justin. What are you doing out there? Are you out in the field? Maybe he's not. Okay. okay. Hi. <laughs> so the crowd um, has gathered. Yeah. So let me let me silence the crowd really quick. <laughs> oh look, look, we got something excellent. All right. So I guess okay, if, I'm back. If um, if I can if I can help interpret here, then uh, audience, what you're looking at there is the big uh, white dot in the middle is Jupiter. That's the planet Jupiter, and then. You can see just kind of trailing off to the upper left and then the lower right, just sort of like at a little bit of an angle, those little tiny dots, the real fine little sort of like tiny things are uh, the moons. And the one in the upper left, the one kind of above and to the left is uh, Europa. That's, that's the moon we've been talking about tonight. And uh, it's not exactly the same view as, as ever it was showing us in those, those images, but it's, it's, it's amazing. And it's historic um, because we've been actually sort of seeing these moons and watching them for uh, a little bit over 400 years now, 410 years. And so uh, I'm going to be kind of like sharing some, some history with that with you. Then the other ones on the other side 
The nearest to Jupiter is Io, which is also the nearest moon to Jupiter. So uh, down on the lower right side, the uh, next one over is Ganymede, which is the largest moon in the system. And then way out there someplace, can you see Callisto? It's going to be in that direction. I can't quite make it out down, down towards the lower left. It's going to be kind of over by you. Yeah, there it is. That's exactly, that's exactly it. So Callisto is actually the furthest moon uh, of these four in the system. And it's also the smallest. So it's a, um, that's great. And so, and then I can hear a bunch of people around there. What do you have people out there watching with you and they're like getting excited about what's going on? Yeah, exactly. So um, for everyone who doesn't know me, my name is Justin. Um, I am the vice president of the something called SEDS, which is the Students for Exploration and Development Space. Right now, along with the virtual of uh, the virtual night sky, we're having a small telescope event on campus, you know, in person where we're going to, where we have three telescopes set out. One telescope for Jupiter um, for you guys to see um, live. There's a, another telescope for the set um, club to be using, which is also looking at the same planet, same same moons. And another telescope, which is which is just for people in person, is going to be Saturn. So um, our club, you know, is organized to um, foster conversation about space. It's the one club you can go to where you don't have to justify why you like looking at planets. You know, um, we talk about these ideas all the time. And if you're interested, if you're a student, you know, you can go to Sun Devil Org and look up our, look up our club and see kind of what it, what events I'm interested in. Excellent. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, it's this is, has become a success. I wasn't sure as we were kind of coming up about the uh, the beginning of the program at seven o'clock, we weren't kind of like zeroed in yet. But this is a really an excellent image, and so uh, so good for you guys. And then the um, oh, well, I'm going to kind of move to if you guys. Oh, I see. Sort of centering it again over there. Okay. I'm gonna uh, kind of share my screen and just kind of move to a little view and sort of talk a little bit about um, the moons and how they were discovered and what we know about them and, and some little known history about uh, how these moons are, were used to tell time and determine longitude at one point in our history. So uh, let me just kind of like take over the screen and do that, optimize, into the sky, share. So I think some of you that have been watching us and how we do this program before, you probably this scene will look a little bit familiar. I just love sort of using the technology from that we have here at ASU and broadcasting it out. So what I've done is I've blown up the planets. They don't really look like this. And they're also kind of, they're not exactly this random. If I actually sort of turn some, some orbits on, this is a little bit more how we understand the planets, how we've seen them. But I just wanted to show you these locations. So you can see, let's see, um, first of all, I want to show you something. This is Mars over here. This is the Earth over here. And the sun is in the middle. In fact, Mercury and the sun and Earth and Mars are all lining up. Um, you're going to hear from Alicia towards the end of the program, uh, kind of in our current events. That's kind of important. Uh, when Mars passes behind the sun, that's called a conjunction, and it has an impact on Mars research. We just sort of have to like take a little bit of a break for a little while. And she'll be telling a little bit more about that. If I sort of like flip around the other way, you can see that, uh, that the Venus is still very visible in our night sky, but it's getting closer and closer to the sun. So as, uh, as it moves in its orbit, it's gonna move in this direction. As we move in our orbit, we're moving in this direction and uh, Venus is going to overtake us move down faster than we are. And eventually what that effect will be is that the evening sky, Venus will sort of dive into the, into the sunset and you won't see it anymore. But the good news is facing kind of away from the sun um, uh, on the dark side of the earth. That's where we are now on the other side. We have this beautiful view now and for the next several months of Jupiter and Saturn. And if you sort of like look at the, so the mechanics here, you can see that we're in our, our orbit. We've already had our, uh, our nearest approach. We call that opposition. Uh, and we're gone past that a little bit, but we're still in our orbit and their orbits uh, kind of closer to Jupiter than we get during most of the year. And not only do we have the great view of Jupiter, it's uh, just large and in charge. It's easy to find. It's in your Southern sky right after sunset. If you look to the south on your right hand, you're going to see Venus is huge and bright, still the brightest object in the sky, heading for the horizon on the west. And if you look just a little bit south and a little bit to the east, you'll see two bright objects. They're going to look like stars, but the brighter one is going to be Jupiter and the dimmer one 
is going to be uh, Saturn and they're going to be available to us for a while. I'm just going to kind of like uh, set up another uh, view here. I'm going to center Jupiter and uh, kind of get it onto the screen. And uh, I'm going to just sort of like uh, change position just a little bit here. Let me back up a little bit so you can see some of those moons again. There they are. So I've got now Jupiter and the moons. Remember what we were talking about. This is Europa over here. Uh, Io is here. Um, uh, Ganymede is the next one, and Callisto is uh, back up way out. Uh, Callisto is the one way out there in, uh, in space. And so this is their orientation right now. While uh, I'm going to keep your mind on this view, I'm just going to kind of walk through a little, um, a little history with you. Galileo is the first one to actually see these moons. The four moons we're talking about are called the Galilean moons, and that's just really after him. This is because Galileo was the discoverer. This is an example of the telescope he used. This is from the museum, Galileo Museum in Florence, Italy. And uh, they have some of his instruments there, and they have some great models of the instruments there. They really have a great program to understand Galileo and his, uh, and his contribution to space. Uh, Galileo didn't invent the telescope. In fact, the telescope was invented uh, by a Belgian, as far as we knew, this kind of obscure little bit named Lipperhey. And it was actually not made for looking at stars or planets or moons. It was actually made for uh, looking at ships at sea. So shipping was going around and these big, huge merchants would come into port. Uh, if they had a good view of that ship a long way out to sea, they could tell who it was. They could tell if it's one that they were expecting or if it's some sort of rogue thing, if it's pirates, if they're under attack, if it's a merchant ship, they could tell uh, by looking out there. And so it was really the practical application of the early telescopes were actually sort of to use in ports like Venice and, uh, and, and others to see ships well before they get into shore. So you could see that. Um, Galileo sort of used it to, uh, and, uh, and to, uh, he was the first one to sort of like use it for night sky. Famously, uh, um, it, it was sort of, it was not in the best interest of the church as they felt at the time to have somebody looking that closely at those planets and moons and seeing things that weren't necessarily known. And uh, so this is him, uh, this is actually the Doge of Venice that he's showing this to. And, uh, and giving him an example of what can be seen with the, uh, with the telescope. I just want to show you this. I just really love this because uh, Galileo uh, published a work called Sidereus Nuncus, and it was essentially from his explorations with the telescope. And, uh, and it's, you, this, this could be a whole program, and I invite you to kind of go look at some of this history and understand what this means. Uh, Sidereus Nuncus means, um, Nuncius means uh, the starry messenger. And in it, he describes the things that he saw, uh, the phases of Venus, mountains on the moon, uh, right? It's never been seen before, the surface of the moon uh, that you could sort of like project that was mountainous. But this is the one I wanted to focus on. This is the, uh, the winter of 1609, 1610. These are actual days. And this is uh, Galileo's notation. Doesn't this look familiar? Doesn't this just look exactly like what uh, 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 Justin and team outdoors were showing us today? You have Jupiter here and the indication of the moons. And what he was doing is noticing that they're changing position night to night, week to week. The moons are doing their orbit around Jupiter and changing position. And this is the first time this was ever recorded, 410 years ago, uh, uh, in these, this really, really cold winter in Italy. Uh, it was the first time. And, and so what he described, what was happening here, is he was seeing a system. He was seeing objects moving around another planet. And that was groundbreaking. That hadn't been done before. Right. Remember, the whole idea was the Earth was the center of everything and everything revolved around the Earth at some level. In this particular case, it's like seeing a system of objects moving around another planet. So so that was very, very exciting. I'm just going to kind of like show you one more thing. I know we're going to kind of run behind tonight, but I was fascinated by this. I don't know, a long time ago, a book came out not that long ago, 15 years ago, called Undaunted Courage. And it was about Lewis and Clark. It was kind of getting ready for the celebrating their 200th anniversary of traveling across the, the, uh, the country. Um, they actually had a telescope with them on their journey. And here's what we were able to do. 
early on uh, in France, uh, there's an a astronomical family called Cassini. Cassini actually did a lot of the, one of the Cassini astronomers did a lot of detailed work on measuring the timings of the moons. And he made tables and almanacs, and he could actually predict where the moons were going to be at any given time. When a moon passes behind Jupiter or in front of Jupiter, it disappears. It just kind of snaps out of view. When it comes back in, it just kind of snaps back into view again. And he actually described the timings of all this. So you could, if you had a telescope, you could actually watch the moons. And when you saw these timings, you could compare it to your almanac and you could tell what time it was, right? Way back when, longitude was impossible to determine because we had to have a means of reckoning time and counting time uh, while you're on your journey. And it happened with uh, Alexander McKinsey in Canada as he was crossing Canada, Lewis and Clark as they were going across Northern America. Uh, they actually used this technology and carried a telescope with them so that they could do these timings, uh, predict the time, and then they would know by uh, star charts and other almanac uh, sources uh, exactly what their longitude was, where they were east-west as they were traveling across the country. Uh, so it, it's actually sort of uh, you know part of our history and it's part of uh, uh, a really clever way to use these moons, the timing of those moons, um, uh, to actually do something a little bit different. Um, I love that kind of stuff. And you can read about Lewis and Clark and their journey and some of this stuff. Uh, the last slide I was going to show you in this particular system is that there are seven really, really large moons in our solar system that kind of stand above all the rest of the moons in our solar system. Some of them get very, very, very small. Uh, four of these, of course, are the ones that are the subject of tonight, Ganymede and Callisto, Io and Europa. <clears throat> These are the ones, and in order of uh, from Saturn, Io is the closest, Europa is the next, uh, Ganymede is the next, and Callisto is the next. Ganymede is the largest moon in our solar system. Uh, it's followed by Titan of Saturn, uh, Callisto back of Jupiter and all that. So also we can add Triton of Neptune and that makes up the, and our own moon, and that makes up the seven largest moons in the, in the solar system four of them belonging to Jupiter. And those four moons are the ones that you saw in, um, in the telescope tonight and see on the screen in front of you. Uh, so um, I'm just gonna kind of just show you a couple more things about these moons because that's kind of exciting. Uh, they orbit fairly quickly. Uh, I'm, so I'm gonna kind of put their little moon orbits up so you can see, get them organized. And you can see they actually sort of like have this, this planar kind of orbit around uh, Jupiter. Uh, as we were talking in Dr. Everett Schock's program, uh, 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 the uh, spacecraft is actually gonna orbit Jupiter in a north-south orbit. And then every time it flies by Europa, uh, we'll get a nice little view of it. It goes back around and it's kind of wild orbit out, organized to just fly as close as it can to Europa. I'm also going to sort of like move forward in time a little bit because I can. And there's something really, really interesting that happens to these moons if you can watch this. I'm going to get a little bit close. I'm going to get down uh, close to the, the three. It, I don't know if you can see this, but watch Io. I'm going to slow it down just a little bit. Watch Io very closely. And notice that every second time it goes around, right, it passes right by Europa, right? Bam. So then it goes around once, and then it goes around again, and it passes right by Europa. And then notice what's going on with Ganymede. There is a resonance happening here. And so what that means is that these moons, as tiny as they are, uh, were largely influenced by the gravity of Jupiter, but they actually exert just a tiny, tiny little bit of influence on each other. And so after millions, if not billions of years of travel around this planet and in these very stable orbits, they've actually sort of organized themselves in these resonant um, uh, areas. So you'll see every once in a while, uh, after about four orbits of Europa, these three moons actually line up uh, including and across the surface of the planet. So this is sort of like some of the things that we've studied, some of the things we've understood from, uh, from early uh, uh, understanding of these moons and what they do. And one more thing I wanted to show you, and then I'll close this and we'll get on with closing out our particular program, uh, is that uh, Jupiter actually has lots of moons. 
So I've lit up uh, the orbits of several of the other objects that are moons orbiting. But look at this sort of thing. If you sort of like look at the properties here, you have the four inner orbits, which are our stars tonight, the, uh, 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 the four uh, Galilean moons. And then you have all of these wild orbits that are sort of like going to moons, go traveling around Jupiter. We think it has about 65 moons altogether. Not all of them are represented here. Uh, but uh, the moons uh, that we're talking about, the four are very different from each other. And then the moons that sort of are in these outer orbits around Jupiter, uh, there's little known about them, but they're also carrying these orbits as if they were kind of asteroid kind of objects that got caught by the gravitational attraction of Jupiter and kind of settled into uh, this, this little mess we see right now. So um, that's a little bit uh, of uh, what we wanted to show you. One more quick thing, and then I'm going to turn this over because in our particular program, uh, we do a lot of work doing visualizations for people. Several years ago, my team was working in the Marston Theater, and uh, we came up with this little sort of funny thing that happened. I'm going to show you here real quick. I'm going to move to um, the date, <clears throat> turn off these orbits, and I'm moving to the date that Galileo was looking at the moons. So here they are arranged in 1610 in January. I've got this on January 15th of 1610s. And you can see this is kind of how he would map them and all this stuff. But uh, check this out. In the background, behind these moons is another object. And it is, I will just make it really, really big, right? See it's sort of coming into view back there. That is actually Uranus, the planet. And so I did the calculations. I looked at this very, very closely and I sort of determined that, that Uranus was never really in his very tight field of view, but look how close it is to where Galileo was looking. Uranus was actually not discovered for another 175 years after uh, the Galilean moons and the work that Galileo did. And so I just think what a really quirk of uh, fate, right? That Galileo was spending all this time looking at this part of the sky and right behind him, right in the background, right over here, another object in the night sky that he wouldn't have been able to interpret as a planet, uh, but it was just there sort of like waiting to be discovered. And I guess he sort of missed it. There's no record that he saw anything about Uranus in the night sky. Okay, uh, real quickly, um, I just, I promised you last week, just a little quick discussion about what you need to see these moons yourself. And it's actually fairly easy. You can't see it with the unaided eye, but just a regular pair of binoculars, the kind of binoculars you have around your house will actually work. And so I'm gonna invite you to try that. So your assignment this week is to go out, find these three planets, Jupiter, Saturn, and Venus. Make sure you watch them for the next several weeks and months because they're all doing something different in the night sky. They'll be prominent. But try a couple of instruments. Try, you know, find those binoculars, get them out of the closet and see if you could take a look at Jupiter. And I'm going to suggest to you that you find a way to steady those binoculars. Very, very difficult to hold them and keep them steady. The, uh, the, the object will be moving around and all that stuff. And uh, uh, so I'm going to do I'm going to suggest you do that. Uh, Justin, are you back? Are you still there? I'm going to kind of like send it back to you and then I'll make my closing comments with the uh, view of Jupiter if you're there. Do we have him? He probably doesn't know I'm going back to him. Uh, the other thing that will work, I don't know, some of you might be birders and the same kind of scopes or land-based sort of like just sort of spotting scopes and things like that, that you would use to do bird watching. We'll find these moons of Jupiter. Uh, the bigger the binoculars, the bigger the scope, the better you'll see them, but it doesn't take much to do this. And so I think everybody has access to these moons in some way or another. Uh, if you have a little hobby telescope, the kind that you sort of like tried a couple of times and then put up on the shelf, that will work. You'll be able to see these moons as well. And then you can compare these moons to charts that are readily available on the internet that'll show you which moons are where so you can identify them and name them and then watch them over time because they move very very, very fast. Io just goes around that planet in about 17 hours. So even in an evening, you can see a change in position, and especially Io and Europa as they get closer to, go behind, go 
in front and go past uh, 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 Jupiter. So, so that's really sort of the talk tonight, the night sky observing tonight. Uh, check out Jupiter, make sure you take advantage of, uh, of its position in this particular time so we, uh, you get a good view of it. I am going to close this out and I'm going to turn it back over to my team so we can kind of really, I know we're running about five or 10 minutes over, but you know, that's the way to go sometimes. So, uh, so we'll kind of like start to close down. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, Rick. I'm going to go ahead and share this week's current events. So our current events are, if it'll load, just a little slow here. Um, Alicia, Alicia, we have some of your stuff in front of the, the, the image. All right. How about, let's see if I can move this far away. You're trying to get all this stuff on one screen. I can do. How's this? Better? Yes, that's OK, yeah. Yes, you're at the bottom. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> All right. Well, hot off the NASA presses since we last met is a new Lucy mission video, which features an ASU led um, instrument called the Lucy Thermal Emission Spectrometer, or LTES for short. And this instrument provides temperature uh, measurements of each Jupiter Trojan asteroid. And the space that the spacecraft will encounter. Uh, so we'll be rooting for the ASU-led LTES team as well as the Lisp Space Academy uh, at the launch, which is happening on October 16th of this year. So just next week. And uh, what better way to talk about it than show this new video? So I'm going to play that now. The Lucy spacecraft will be taking a journey where no other spacecraft has gone before, the Trojan asteroids. The Trojans are two groups of asteroids that lead and trail Jupiter in its orbit around the Sun, and they've been trapped in these stable locations for over 4 billion years. Lucy will have a suite of scientific instruments for collecting data as it flies by the asteroids. The LORI is a long-range reconnaissance imager. It's often referred to as Lucy's eagle eyes, since it has the highest spatial resolution of all of Lucy's cameras. This black and white camera is actually a type of telescope, the same kind as the Hubble Space Telescope. The LORI was built to produce clear images of the Trojan's craters, which will be a challenge since the Trojan asteroids are extremely dark. LaLaurie will be able to see 75-yard-wide craters from over 600 miles away. That's like standing at one end of a football field and being able to see a fly at the other end. The instrument's simple design does not use optical filters and includes no moving parts, reducing the risk of part failure during the mission. LaLaurie will also search the Trojans for evidence of any rings and new satellites. The instrument's ability to see faint targets from far away also makes it perfect for optical navigation. LaLaurie will help Lucy navigate to a point in space, and then a terminal tracking camera aboard the spacecraft, known as T2CAM, will help the instruments accurately point towards the targets. LATES is Lucy's thermal emission spectrometer, which detects far infrared radiation emitted by the asteroids due to how they are heated up by sunlight. LATES detects this radiation using a small telescope to focus the incoming energy onto a detector, similar to the way a remote thermometer works. So, the test is not taking images, but rather temperature measurements at various points on the asteroid. This data will be combined so that scientists can get an understanding of its surface properties. LATES will examine the properties of the regolith on the surface by measuring thermal inertia, which is the measure of how slowly the asteroid heats up from sunlight and then releases that heat. By taking the temperature readings at different parts of the asteroid, the Lucy science team can measure the thermal inertia and figure out how much dust, sand, or rock is present on the asteroid's surface. That data will tell us a lot about how the asteroid was formed, providing insight into the history of our solar system. Lucy's Le Ralph instrument will search the Trojans for organics, ices, and hydrated minerals, and will help determine the surface compositions of the asteroids. The Ralph is actually two instruments in one, and together they will measure and analyze the spectra of light absorbed and reflected by the asteroid. The first is a color visible imager, the Multispectral Visible Imaging Camera, or MVIC. It takes visible light color images of the Trojan asteroids. The second is an infrared imaging spectrometer, known as LISA, the Linear Edelon Imaging Spectral Array, which collects infrared spectra of the asteroids. 
Like LaLaurie, the Ralph does not have a focusing mechanism. Instead, it is designed to stay in focus despite the extreme temperature differences in space by being made almost entirely from a single block of aluminum. Using one material throughout the instrument means that if a part expands or contracts, the other parts will expand or contract at the same rate, helping to keep Le Ralph in focus. Even the mirrors are made of aluminum, finely polished with diamond dust. Due to the massive size of the images Le Ralph will be taking, the instrument will have around 256 gigabits of onboard memory. And while the Le Ralph instrument aboard Lucy does require substantially more power than its predecessors on other spacecraft, it will still not use more energy than your average ceiling fan. In addition to these three main science instruments, other experiments aboard the spacecraft will help fulfill the mission. Lucy will use its high-gain antenna to communicate with Earth for an additional radio science experiment to determine the masses of the asteroid targets. Lucy will also be able to use its two terminal tracking cameras, or T2 cam, to track the asteroids during the flybys, keep them in the field of view, and to take wide-field images so that we can better determine their shapes and perhaps discover new asteroids nearby. As you can see, the Lucy spacecraft has a large suite of tools to study the Trojan asteroids, which will help us better understand the formation of our solar system. So just a quick little video about Lucy. Um, make sure that you uh, check your email for um, a link that Kim will send out, I'm sure, uh, about October 16th. Um, and moving right along, the Arizona Historical Society is featuring an exhibit, uh, and that runs through November 30th. So just a reminder to go and visit that before it ends. Um, and Rick had mentioned the Mars conjunction, and so I'm here to talk about that a little bit. And uh, just a reminder, this is not to scale. But what this means is that Earth and Mars are on opposite sides of the sun. And that just slows down communication for NASA um, and for Martian satellites quite a little bit because of the, um, the solar energy that, or the solar radiation that the sun is giving off. It can interfere with transmissions. And so this is a two week period where our Mars team kind of gets to take a little break and things will slow down drastically. And then after the two week period, things will turn back on and we will get that data. It'll take about a week to download everything from the pause. And then once everything is downloaded, we should be able to resume normal activities. And again, this happens ever, about every two years. Um, and it, we do it so that we don't lose data. We stop um, transmitting things for about two weeks so that we don't corrupt any files or data. All right, and moving right along to my last current event of today, some really exciting news just recently um, on October 1st, the European Space Agency received images from a mission called Vipi Colombo. And this is really exciting because it traveled all the way to Mercury. And these are some of the first images that we have gotten back. And so we're excited to share them with you. Uh, and please keep an eye out for um, these new images coming from Mercury, um, from Vipi Colombo. And that's by the European Space Agency, if I didn't say that. Um, but that ends our current event. I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Alex for our resources. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah, so we have another resource that's uh, very closely connected to the Lucy mission. I'll just put it up on the screen. Uh, this is an event bright sign up for NASA's Lucy mission, the launch. Um, there's going to be a link in chat and also uh, subsequent emails after the show. But um, this is just registration for uh, the launch event, live viewing, um, it's not set in stone. There are still variations with weather and time and everything, but signing up for this will give you uh, updates and events and then eventually uh, an invitation to view the event uh, live online. So be sure to sign up for that if you want to, um, or at least get some information on it. And uh, back to Rick. Thank you. And the schedule for that, right, it, it can slip because of weather and stuff, but the schedule for that is actually really, really early in the morning our time. So if you do want to sort of watch the launch live and see all that activity, um, uh, I think you're, you're talking about two in the morning to actually sort of like make that happen. So, but hey, sign up and do it. And we will give uh, people an update at our next uh, virtual night sky about the launch and uh, about what was going on. Okay, we've gone long and I'm sorry about that, but gosh, we had a great program tonight and I just really wanted to give 
if uh, we can just do to uh, uh, to the, to the planet Jupiter, uh, the fact that it's up there, it's large and in charge, we get to watch it right now and see these moons because they're historic and uh, and they're accessible and everybody should uh, take advantage of that. Um, the very last thing is tomorrow night is another event. We got back to backs this time. We can actually call that series New Discoveries Lecture Series. Tomorrow night, Roger Windhorst is going to be uh, with a team, with a panel of, uh, of uh, staff and students are going to be talking about the James Webb Space Telescope. It starts at seven o'clock, very, very much like our program. Uh, it's about seven to eight. It includes a panel discussion about the James Webb Telescope and preparations to get it launched in December this year. And, uh, and you'll hear from that entire team. And then there's some questions and answers after that. So sorry, we're throwing all this stuff at you together, but we have no control of these schedules. There's just a lot going on right now. Um, you know, I, I just forgot all about the European Space Agency uh, mission to Mercury. That's the first time we've gotten close up uh, views of Mercury since the messenger mass mission of several years ago. So um, things just happening very, very fast, lots of launches, lots of connections to ASU. We want to keep in front of you. And then I also want to kind of just do a quick shout out and thank the students that were out in the field today. Um, uh, Matreya Sonawe is works for us. He was kind of running the telescopes. Justin Baez, as you heard from um, with the SEDS program, was uh, helping keep the crowd under control and showing us a really live picture of Jupiter to kind of top off our evening. So, so thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back in two weeks. Uh, make sure that you watch the, uh, um, uh, the links that we give you and some more information about uh, tomorrow night if you want to join us again that's going to be an amazing program and uh, and we'll see you uh, i really appreciate everybody uh coming to the program tonight and we'll see you in a couple of weeks thanks <laughs>